Uh, this is about enabling individuals to have access to these opportunities, whether it's returning back to work uh, because your uh, mother who has been at home or an individual who's a retiring veteran who also probably was a mother too. Um, and reducing barriers and making this profession more accessible, I think, is fundamental. This is a Security Weekly production. Security Weekly is a resource of Cyber Risk Alliance. The Cybersecurity Collaborative, in conjunction with Cyber Reason, is proud to present CISO Stories. Each week, CISO Stories takes a deep dive on security leadership. The Cybersecurity Collaborative is a unique membership community enabling cybersecurity leaders to work together in a trusted environment. To learn more, visit securityweekly.com slash CSC. Hi, I'm your host, Todd Fitzgerald, and this week we welcome Alex Nigelo, Senior Vice President, Cybersecurity Coordination and Advocacy at MasterCard, and John Bricky, Cybersecurity Evangelist at MasterCard. Unfortunately, it's a pretty staggering uh, challenge that we have. Um, as of uh, last year, we have roughly 550,000 open positions in the United States in cybersecurity, uh, broadly defined. And the idea that some of the best paying, most desired positions uh, in this country continue to remain open at that level clearly presents a real issue. And so it began to uh, question what the problem and the barrier is for us on how we can both recruit talent uh, to help both our government, but also how we can help our companies like ours and Microsoft and Workday who are also participating in this and a whole host of others who are working uh, around this issue. Did, that, did I mishear you? Did, did you say there's over 500,000 open positions in this field today? You did not mishear me. Um, and these are some of the best paying uh, jobs. And so the idea that we continue to struggle to bring in talent here um, is perplexing uh, to say the least and something that both needs to be addressed uh, by companies like ours. So why do you think we have all these open positions today? So I think it's a, a broad spectrum of issues. Um, one, it continues to be an emerging industry, uh, an area that wasn't always approachable uh, to individuals, um, but certainly at a younger age, wasn't approachable. Um, it wasn't immediately accessible from traditional career pipelines through universities and advanced degrees. Uh, and so we've been thinking about how to make that easier. Second, uh, as we have individuals in uh, these programs, in the traditional pipelines, um, there have been a massive amount of problems around student debt issues. Uh, and uh, if you thought that the 500 plus thousand number was staggering, um, I've got one that will blow uh, your top off here. Uh, and that is roughly $1.9 trillion in outstanding student debt in this country uh, alone. Uh, the idea that Barack Obama, who I had the pleasure of working for in the White House before joining MasterCard, uh, barely paid off his student loans as president of the United States is a remarkable statement about the challenge and some of the barriers that exist for individuals in this country. And, and what is that, that average? I think my kids probably had most of that student debt. Um, but but what, is, what is the average for that? So um, it's all relative, but the, the numbers range in uh, public universities between and average student debt for about $30,000 in an undergraduate degree and range uh, up towards about $50,000 uh, uh, and well above, depending on certain outliers, um, for advanced degrees in this country. The fact that that could be um, a barrier to both service and government and to joining companies like ours is deeply frustrating and deeply concerning, um, both to what it means about upward mobility, but also enabling the brightest and best in our country and in the world to uh, be thought leaders and also um, build companies like ours. 
I, I know that my kids did, didn't end up with a large amount of student debt, but they, but they had that they had the opportunity and they had the jobs and and you know how are we reaching you know underrepresented areas that may not have those same opportunities to you know to be able to pay off that debt and then end up with that debt at the end. Yeah, no, I, I think it's a, a fantastic point. Uh, underrepresented speaks to a whole host of communities, whether it's gender um, in, and, and this is a broad uh, uh, community, right? In cybersecurity and technology and uh, the STEM area, the uh, breadth of gender disparity as well as racial disparity similarly continues to be concerning. And so one of the things that we're most proud of is the program has in the most recent cohort of uh, talent brought in over 34 participants with between about 5% above national averages on over to 17% above national averages on both gender and demographics and national origin. Um, and uh, one area I'm particularly proud of where I have the pleasure of having John Brickey, my colleague, um, here, who is a veteran as well, uh, is the veterans uh, that we've also brought into the program. And I think the career skill set uh, that our military veterans and uh, folks bring is uh, especially important. Yeah, I find the, the the training in the military is is really good um, when people come out of the military and have those skill sets. And there and there may be, you know, an assimilation into the workforce into a different type working structure, right? Because we end up in these corporate worlds where people don't always do what they're told, unfortunately, right? <laughs> Um, so we, we have kind of a, a different dynamic there as well, but but we have the the fundamental uh, skill sets that have, have really been trained really well in the military, and that's that's the the premise here, right? So let's take it a step back, even just from the military. Um, the participating agencies in this program range from the CIA to the Department of Commerce and NOAA, the National Oceanic. Uh, and Air Knox administration, um, which helps keep our weather and our entire oceans uh, safe and secure in our capabilities on over to the Department of Defense to, I don't know, little issues like the Federal Election, election Commission, um, where nothing could possibly go wrong, right? Um, so <laughs> we have an incredibly uh, robust set of federal agencies. Um, I think veterans speak to that, both in the military service but it speaks to the broader expertise of what the program uh, sets up and enables is a pathway uh, for individuals who might not otherwise have been as readily able to enter into government service for two years, followed by two years with one of our respective companies and hopefully more, um, followed by us covering off up to $75,000 in outstanding student debt. I think that's a pretty spectacular uh, capacity here mm -hmm. of amazing companies, amazing government agencies, and enabling folks to um, have that access. So, so tell us about the, the program. It's called the, the Cybersecurity Talent Initiative. Um, what, what's this program all about? So the, the program really is fundamentally about um, a three-part uh, priority how we can provide immediate talent into federal agencies um, and build a pipeline that makes it more accessible, both for undergraduates and individuals pursuing an advanced degree. Um, and how, uh, and by the way, that number that I gave of about 500 plus thousand, about 20 plus thousand of that uh, is represented by the federal government of open positions. Um, and so the immediate need there, whether it's things like solar winds or colonial pipe, colonial pipelines, uh, and the list goes on. I don't think I need to uh, tell anyone in this audience the um, importance of this issue and the challenge uh, that we all collectively face um, about how we support individuals going into government, but also the capacity and, frankly, interoperability of us and skill sets that our generation has learned fundamentally coming into companies like MasterCard and Workday and Microsoft 
uh, and beyond um, uh, to to join this the ranks here. So, so somebody applies to this this program, and then they get accepted, and then they they work for two years in the federal government. Yep. Uh, and in the course of that, um, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Good. Um, and in the course of that, uh, there's a leadership development and curriculum that occurs in addition to the on-the-job experience that each of these individuals will have. And we've seen remarkable outcomes um, and the support that our technical partners like Cyber Vista have provided on allowing people to understand. And frankly, look, I wish I had the leadership development and someone over my shoulder supporting me um, when I came out of school. Uh, and went into a company uh, that we're all collectively providing here. And it's a shared belief set, both from our federal agencies, but also our companies. The article this podcast is based upon can be viewed in the best-selling cybersecurity leadership book, CISO Compass, Navigating Cybersecurity Leadership Challenges with Insights from Pioneers, available at Amazon.com and other booksellers. Yeah, I mean, that is so important. And, 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 you know, teaching a lot of the cybersecurity leadership courses, we see that, you know, technology is important, but, but it's also about that, that leadership, you know, within, within the organization itself. And so, so they go into the federal government, they spend two years there. Um, then, then what happens, what happens after that? Sure. So, uh, what happens after that is that they, um, work towards transitioning to one of our respective companies. Um, understandably, there is an application um, process which proceeds, but the goal is that each individual um, that is part of the program is brought in. Um, and the, it wasn't an accident that each individual was selected for this program up front. Um, it's incredibly rigorous um, and thoughtful, uh, and the individuals that have been brought into the federal agencies. Um, both on uh, our workforce, uh, excuse me, our workforce efforts um, with uh, the Partnership for Public Service um, and a number of former federal government individuals uh, has done fantastic work at screening and bringing great talent uh, into this program. I, I again, I, I'm incredibly proud of the fact that we've been just as rigorous um, that I described and the numbers that we're hitting in terms of our uh, numbers and transitions into our respective companies. So, so for somebody with the right motivation and the desire and the passion to really make this a career, uh, this is really a good pathway for somebody that, that may not have had that opportunity otherwise. Very much so. It also, I think, um, is something that, as I think about um, as new corporate partners come on and new government agencies begin to join, and it's a pretty remarkable set, as I already mentioned, um, uh, that allows entities that have a broader objective of supporting their franchises and supporting their company globally, allows individuals with talent to become uh, more involved in this space, but also recognizes that, frankly, uh, let's be honest, uh, a sophomore in college doesn't totally know exactly what they want to do. That's okay. And this helps make that pathway more accessible and more approachable. And, and so what, what happens when they, they, they're done with the federal government and they, if they decide not to go into a company and stay with the federal government, what happens then? Sure. So what happens then is that they stay with the federal government and they have a fantastic opportunity with a great set of agencies that I mentioned. Um, one thing that it was a priority uh, as we were standing up this program was a recognition that um, we're trying to reduce barriers. We're not trying to set up further barriers. And this is a way that allows people, if you have the, the final call for government service and want to stay in government, that's totally okay. I may go back into government at some point. John might go back into government at some point. I love working at MasterCard and it's been a fantastic experience. But 
What we don't want to do is set up further roadblocks. And I've already identified a number of them, ranging from the diversity challenges that we've seen on over to student debt. Um, and this is meant to make uh, this effort accessible and approachable. Well, it, it sounds like a great effort that the federal government gets gets the use of uh, these individuals and gets the, the training, uh, you know, or the individuals get the, the training opportunities. And then the companies also then get to leverage seeing this talent come out. Um, it, it sounds like a win-win for for everybody, and the companies are that are willing to be partners to this um, are putting up finan a financial stake in helping people be successful in the end. I, I couldn't agree more. I think you forgot one win, and that's on the individuals that get to participate in the program, right? So to me, it's a win-win-win. Uh, it helps the federal government. It helps our companies grow the talent that we need, and it helps individuals who are that talent actually have that access and opportunity. And I think one of the things that I've been also concerned about a bit, uh, Todd, frankly, has been the ease in access in which you transition from a federal agency at certain points on over to a company and the way in which we make hiring decisions and how we think about that. And one of the areas of work that my partner, John Bricky has been doing uh, such great work on is building that pipeline around the NICE framework and making that more accessible. Yeah, and, and it's great to have MasterCard uh, involved with the uh, Cybersecurity Collaborative. Uh, Ron Green is on our executive committee. Uh, John Bricky attends uh, some of those executive committee meetings uh, as well. Um, and I'd like to uh, turn it over to John. Uh, tell us a little bit about the work that, that you're doing on this uh, cybersecurity uh, talent uh, initiative uh, to, to help us in other ways as well. Yeah, thanks, Todd. Um, so I'm very fortunate uh, to have been working uh, really out of curiosity several years ago when I was in the military with um, the, the NIST team that formed the nucleus of the National Initiative for Cybersecurity Education, uh, Cyber Accordion Council. And um, they asked me to become the industry co-chair just under two years ago. And so that really kind of thrust me into the limelight and and I get, get to see an awful lot of the, the, the goodness as well as the, the, the challenges. Um, and CTI is just one of those uh, programs that's helping us solve some of the challenges out there. But there's an awful lot going on out there that's, that's good that people really don't know about. So that's one thing I'm trying to do is work more on the industry side to increase awareness. Um, and what I really like about this, you know, Alex and I work together at MasterCard, but the what I'm doing with that group and what we're doing with the CTI really mesh together well. So the, the thing about the NICE Cybersecurity Workforce Framework is it's a common lexicon. It's a standard. We love working with standards because it's all about interoperability. So when someone comes in through the CTI and they go to work for the government, when they come to MasterCard or any of the other companies that are sponsors, there's interoperability and understanding what the knowledge, skills, abilities, and tasks are for the certain work roles, and also understanding competencies. So uh, that's that's the the beauty of this relationship and the partnership. And um, you know, we're looking to leverage the the benefits of, of this program and and also. Uh, bring them into our workforce and, and, and help us see how the interoperability is good for us. And it's good for recruiting in general, as well as development once they're at the workforce, and then ultimately retention. Well, I, I think the NICE framework is a fantastic resource. And, you know, people ask all the time about, you know, what are you doing for this job or that job or what, what sort of uh, roles do I need to have in the organization? I think it's extremely beneficial. Yeah, there's a lot in there that, again, uh, people, uh, for whatever reason, industry has been lagging in adoption. And um, government has actually been out in front to help develop the work roles. There are 52 different work roles now. Um, academia has done a great job in, in asking the government and industry what they need. And so that's where the framework helps because it's, it's again, the common lexicon that we can all look to and say, well, right here are the knowledge, skills, abilities, and tasks. 
these are the work roles. And even if your work role, you describe your job a little bit differently in the title or whatever, uh, what I'm finding is that there really are these common KSATs and they, they work across industries as well as across sectors. And, and what are you seeing as like the, the hot security skill sets today that, that are really needed by organizations? Well, again, what's nice about the framework is it's while it does focus on a lot of the technology jobs, it also includes the other jobs. I think, as Alex may have alluded to at the beginning, where people maybe they don't see themselves in these roles or they don't have the the mentoring. Um, if you want to, if you're in the legal aspect or the acquisition aspect of cybersecurity, if you're in the product side, there's there's a role for you in that workforce. Um, some of the common ones. I think a lot, many organizations say have security operations centers. So those roles, those, those roles that are include basic skills of understanding what an incident is, understanding the, our adversaries, understanding uh, how to monitor and respond to attacks, um, crisis response. Those, those are all, I guess, at the core, but it's, it's a very wide um, set of skills that, that comprise the entire workforce. And some of them are, are, are just cyber as opposed to cybersecurity. Um, there, there are probably knowledge, skills, abilities, and tasks in the framework that apply to almost any role in an enterprise, even if it's just a few of them, as opposed to someone working in cybersecurity may, you know, you may be able to map 95% or more of your knowledge and skills into the framework. So, so I've seen some some interesting discussions around the way that we actually create job descriptions in, in attracting talent and how we're not being sensitive to things like genders and race and, and so forth. Um, that that the way things get worded uh, may attract us. It may seem to some people that are you know. Uh, you know, they're managing their home, they're managing their family, they're going to work. And now this looks like we're adding on a lot more responsibility uh, to the plate that, that versus flipping this around and making this more of a, uh, you know, this is a career where you can actually help uh, people, you can help protect the elderly or whatever, you know, your passion is. Um, do you see that kind of uh, thinking being put into the, into the uh, workforce framework? Yeah, so the framework itself uh, really is a document that the community has developed. So the community is constantly updating the documents. Um, and one of the work streams within the community is, is the uh, on and off ramps for cybersecurity careers, looking at all walks of life, whether it's someone right out of high school, someone who right out of college, somebody who's coming over from another career. Maybe it's a, maybe it's a, uh, someone who was a stay-at-home mom for many years, now she's ready to enter the workforce, um, or someone who came out of something completely different and for, for unforeseen reasons beyond their control, they now are changing into a, a new career. So it's, it's really dealing with, you know, we think just about everyone has something to contribute and there, and there are ways you can get into that community um, and we're, we're trying to identify those. Um, and there's a lot of, again, a lot of great work going on. We, d- we have to do a better job of, of promoting all the different opportunities. And John could not be more right. And your question is spot on. Um, uh, this is about enabling individuals to have access to these opportunities, whether it's returning back to work uh, because your uh, mother who has been at home or an individual who's a retiring veteran who also probably was a mother too. Um, and reducing barriers and making this profession more accessible, I think, is fundamental and gets to the heart of the question you just asked. That's what this is about. Um, so so is, there a, is there a deadline to get, to get involved in this or how do people apply to, to be part of the cybersecurity talent initiative and be considered? Sure. So there's there's two critical moments of applications here and opportunities. One is for individuals that we're hoping to enter into the next cohort that runs off of the academic cycle of most universities and colleges and academic institutions. You can apply to cybertowninitiative.org. But moreover, we're also looking to build out our corporate partners. 
I listed off a whole host of federal agencies and companies that are supporting this. But let's be honest, at the end of the day, we're not going to be able to address this challenge with just this set of companies and just this set of federal agencies. And so we're looking for a fantastic set of partners that believe in enabling the next set of individuals to join our ranks, both in the federal agencies, but also at our companies. Well, th thanks much for, for that, Alex. And uh, I couldn't agree with you more. I think, it, you know, if we were to just envision this out with all these major companies supporting this initiative, think of how we could really solve this cybersecurity uh, problem. Absolutely. Thank you, Todd. This is really a great pleasure. It, it's, it's been a pleasure. Um, thank you, Alex. Uh, thank you, John. Thank you both for uh, sharing your insights on fixing the cybersecurity talent problem. Thanks, Todd. Appreciate it. CyberReason is the champion for today's defenders, providing an endpoint security platform to prevent, detect, and respond to malicious operations on computers, mobile devices, servers, and the cloud. CyberReason and cyber attacks from endpoints to the enterprise to everywhere. Learn more at cyberreason.com slash CISO stories.